Hello, my pretty flamingos. Welcome to another episode of my costume design slash historical analysis series. I haven't done one of these videos in a while, which is pretty crazy, but this video and my next video will be back on track before I inevitably branch out again. <laughs> Today's topic is Chicago, the 2002 movie musical. Um, I don't think anyone has ever requested for me to do this video, and if you have, I guess I just didn't see it because today's topic is really just going to be a self-fulfilling video for me. <laughs> Chicago is one of my favorite movies of all time. I love the soundtrack. I love the energy. I love Renee Zellweger and Catherine Zeta-Jones. I've been obsessed with this Honey Ragtime sequence since forever. And in the last year or so, I've been really obsessed with the jazz age fashion and makeup. So I feel like that kind of added to a greater appreciation for this movie. This video is going to be kind of different from the other costume design videos I've done. It's not like the other girls. Because rather than breaking down every single costume or different costumes in the movie, I'm actually just going to be talking about 1920s showgirl costumes and revolving my analysis around that. Before we get started, let's take a quick commercial break. Yes, your girl is being sponsored now. Native is a personal care brand that makes vegan, cruelty-free, aluminum-free, paraben-free, and sulfate-free deodorant with simple ingredients like coconut oil and shea butter. It's not sticky, dries quickly, and lasts me all day. I've been using aluminum-free deodorant for over a year now because I learned that aluminum is one of the main ingredients that causes sweat to stain yellow on white shirts. And boy, do I have a lot of white shirts. The ones I have are sandalwood and fig, a deeper sweet scent, palm leaf and bergamot, a fresh tropical scent, and cucumber and mint, a clean fruity scent. My favorite one is palm leaf and bergamot. I like it because it makes me feel like I'm on a beach vacation when in fact I've barely left the house all year. <laughs> but Native has plenty of other scents as well, so there's really something for everyone's preference. The Rue deodorants usually cost $36, but if you use my link down below or enter my code, Mina Lay, you can get them for 33% off, which is $24. There's also free shipping to anywhere in the US. Thank you, Native. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Chicago, the movie Chicago is based on the 1975 stage musical called Chicago, which is based on a 1926 play also called Chicago. The play, written by Maureen Dallas Watkins, is based on the real-life murder trials of Beulah Annan and Belva Gardner. The play is pretty different in that it's not about show business or vaudeville at all, but the two main characters are still called Roxy Hart and Velma Kelly, so at least we have that. Now, the whole musical adaptation situation is kind of sus. Bob Foss, a theater director, initially tried to buy the rights for Chicago from Watkins herself, but she refused adamantly, and it was only when she died did the estate, uh, did her estate sell the rights. John Kander and Fred Ebb wrote the music for Chicago, and they based their musical compositions off of 1920s vaudeville numbers. And as he takes a little trembling hand, greater than the sum of his parts. Listen here, your mama's feeling blue. The movie is actually really iconic in the way that they adapted the stage to the film. Um, I feel like in a lot of movie musicals, when the characters just kind of start singing, like it's difficult for some people to suspend their belief. In Chicago, each musical number is shot in this fantasy-like setting with the characters wearing different costumes than what they're wearing in the real world. It makes it feel more realistic because it's like, oh, the characters are not just actually breaking out into song and dance. <laughs> they're doing that in these stage numbers, but they're acting the way that normal people act otherwise. Does that make sense? Let's quickly define vaudeville for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term. Vaudeville is often used as a synonym for the term variety. Both describe a series of unrelated stage acts averaging about 10 per show. Some theater historian is going to get on my case about this, but the most modern equivalent I can think of to vaudeville is SNL, like if each skit had different actors. These stage acts included comedy skits, singing, dancing, ventriloquy, magical illusions, you name it. 
Prior to the Civil War, variety was performed in less cultured environments like beer halls and variety saloons that mostly catered to men, and these acts were often pretty rugged and unrefined. After the Civil War though, theater owners such as Tony Pastor saw the money-making potential in variety and decided to spruce up their theaters to host variety for the middle class. However, because the term variety was popularly connotated with these disreputable working class sorts of people, these theater owners opted to call their new shows vaudeville because it sounded French and classier, even though it was basically the same thing as variety. Benjamin Franklin Keith, the father of big time entertainment, is one of the biggest players when it comes to gentrifying vaudeville. He and his business partner, Edwin Franklin Alby, very popular name it seems, Franklin, set all kinds of guidelines to ensure a squeaky clean, family friendly form of entertainment. I do want to reiterate that vaudeville is an American concept and there were variety shows in Europe as well, but they were not called vaudeville. The ones in Europe also had like way less puritanical guidelines. <laughs> vaudeville was also not the highest rung of show business during this time. Many performers aimed to get into the extravagant Broadway reviews at some point in their career. Reviews combined elements of vaudeville and burlesque. They were shows that still featured a series of acts, but unlike vaudeville, a single cast would perform the different acts. So I guess SNL would actually be more classified as a review. <laughs> So now that we covered that, the costumes in Chicago were designed by Colleen Atwood, who also did a number of other movies, including Little Women, the 1994 version, which I discussed in my Little Women video. In a press statement for Chicago, Atwood said, After talking with Rob, I understood that the main goal was to separate the world of the imagination from the world in which the characters lived. My initial direction and inspiration came from watching each dance number play out in rehearsal so that I could see what kind of movement went with each song. The reason being, obviously, is that when you're designing costumes for dance sequences, the costumes have to hold up for a number of takes. They have to be practical so that the actors can perform all kinds of acrobatics that the choreography requires. As for individualizing the characters, Atwood said that for Roxy, most of Roxy's real-world outfits were of a skin-toned color palette, while her outfits in her fantasies were stronger and more vibrant. Which makes sense, because when we watch the movie, Roxy is just fully in her head delusional and fame-hungry. That's kind of why she kills Fry Casely to begin with. So you never told anyone about me? Sugar, you were hot stuff. I would have said anything to get a piece of that. Roxy's costume for the musical number Roxy was inspired by an originally a totally trashed 1930s beaded dress that Atwood found in a film studio. Atwood wanted to recreate it and even found vintage beads to give the new costume a similar look. Velma Kelly, on the other hand, is a strong, confident character, so she wears black and bold reds to convey her fearlessness. In Atwood's words, Velma Kelly was the kind of girl that would wear a cocktail dress to lunch. So now I want to break down the elements of Roxy and Velma's showgirl costumes. If you notice, Roxy Hart and Velma Kelly actually wear fringed leotards, not dresses, which makes more sense anyway because leotards allow a wider range of movement for dancers and Roxy and Velma are dancers. Their look is heavily inspired by the 1920s flapper girl. The reason I wanted to talk about 1920s showgirl fashion versus like 1920s flapper fashion is because they were different. If I dissected Roxy and Velma's costumes through the everyday 1920s lens, then I would have to say things like, oh, their hemlines are too high or something like that. But it wouldn't really make much sense because Roxy and Velma are vaudeville performers and show business had a completely different set of guidelines when it came to what was appropriate dress. And for centuries prior, stage performers got away with wearing way more revealing clothing than what was appropriate in regular society. According to Jane Merrill in her book, The Showgirl Costume, which honestly, like I highly recommend purchasing if you're into this area of interest because I heavily relied on this book for this video. But according to Merrill, ballet dancers at the Paris Opera in the 1700s started to wear more revealing clothing because it was easier for movement as well as um, providing kind of shock value to the audience to hold their attention, which meant, you know, more of this. Now compared to France, American attitudes towards sexual expression was more uptight even before the whole Keith and Alby vaudeville circuit. In a journal entry dated April 23rd, 1795, Thomas Perkins wrote about the actresses in the show Telemachus, which was playing at the Paris Opera. 
The nymphs, upwards of 40 in number, were dressed with all the wantonness imaginable. Their dancing, too, is to us Americans indecent in the extreme. And in the 20th century, it was actually illegal for performers to move while being naked. Um, so they were allowed to be nude on stage if they were just standing still, but if they were moving, illegal. But even so, there was still a lot more freedom when it came to costumes on stage compared to in regular society. A lot of that had to do with, once again, dancers needing to move easily, and also the fact that Europe was more relaxed when it came to risque costuming, so theater directors tried to emulate what they saw in Paris. Plus, by the jazz age, the public was in general growing more tolerant of changing ideals on women's sexual behavior, but of course, there were limits. For example, Mae West, you may know her for her acting career in Hollywood films, started off in vaudeville and had a pretty controversial stage presence. She sang songs with highly suggestive lyrics and even had the audacity to address the audience during her performance, which was a practice not allowed in Keith's theaters. Her vaudeville career was limited to small-time vaudeville, which was less prestigious but also more tolerant of suggestive material than Keith's big-time vaudeville circuit. She did try to get into big time vaudeville multiple times at the 1910s, but in 1916, Variety wrote, Unless Miss West can tone down her stage presence in every way, she just as well might hop right out of vaudeville into burlesque. Robert Allen, in his book Horrible Prettiness, described Eva Tengue as the only performer to achieve stardom in big time vaudeville with an act structured around sexual transgression. In 1908, Tangway's performance of Salome and the Dance of the Seven Veils led the New York Times to report that she, quote, wore a costume made of nothing but two pearls. This is what she actually wore, so definitely more than two pearls, but it was pretty scandalous for the time. However, Allen also said that Tangway's performances were very grotesque and comedic and ungraceful, so her onstage sexual expression was thus viewed as um, being comedic and not as a serious offense. Gertrude Hoffman also played Salome the same year, complete with a suggestive dance style and a revealing costume, but she was arrested by local police for it. So in the end, I guess whether or not you were canceled depended on where you were performing and also who you were. But I'm getting off track. I just wanted to say that there is a fine line that directors and performers had to walk when it came to dressing risque, hashtag for the art, and not getting arrested. Let's take a closer look at Roxy and Velma's costumes. They wear fishnets, which is totally fine. Fishnets became a trend in the 1920s among showgirls and they were popular because from a distance, if you're wearing fishnets, um, it looked like you were just wearing black tights. But uh, on stage with all like the lights shining and everything, you could see like the little dots of flesh through the tights, which was, you know, pretty scandalous. They were also popular for dancing because in the 1920s, stockings were made of silk and rayon and were physically restrictive and got sweaty pretty quickly. The pattern holes in fishnet stockings made them more breathable. The leotard was actually invented for the trapeze artist Jules Leotard in the 1850s, though he himself called the garment a maillot. It was created to show off his guns in performance. <whistles> Roxy and Velma's leotards are adorned with fringe, sequins, and beading, which were all popular embellishments for stage costumes in the early 20th century. Of course, the movie costumes are more modernized, like Velma's costume for the song I Can't Do It Alone looks particularly early 2000s, especially the bustier part. But I do think that overall the costumes capture the essence of early showgirl costumes. The reason stage costumes were so incredibly decorated was, you guessed it, to captivate audiences. Before 1900, performers would popularly dress in body stockings covered with rhinestones so that they would literally look like human chandeliers. And it got to a point where the public expected a level of opulence when it came to big productions. One of the biggest musical reviews of the time period, the Ziegfeld Follies, had a public relations office that would regularly announce the high cost and authenticity of the jewels, fabrics, and furs worn on stage. They would even mention how expensive the items not seen by the public were, like, you know, the Irish linen petticoats and the silk bloomers. A 1919 publicity piece proclaims that, quote, only in shoddy chorus girl shows would girls be forced to wear cotton tights and $2 shoes. 
So obviously to make these costumes look as decorative and expensive as possible, it took highly skilled people to design and sew them. Major couturiers for the 1920s musical reviews included Paul Poiré, Madame Rossini, and Max Weldy. They were highly skilled couturiers, but they also needed teams because a lot of these reviews hired like up to hundreds of chorus girls that needed to be dressed. According to Sabine Piolet, an expert on French theater and music hall costumes from 1920 to 1940, no fewer than 300 dressmakers worked in the atelier of Max Weldy. I also want to point out again that Roxy and Velma's costumes resemble flapper dresses, but in general, showgirl costumes of the time ranged in silhouette and design depending on the act. For instance, if the act was about springtime, then the showgirls would wear costumes adorned with fruits and flowers. I think that the reason why production opted to put Velma and Roxy in flapper costumes is to make it clear that this was all happening in the 1920s. The flapper look is probably what most people think of when they think of 1920s fashion, and because this movie is anachronistic in a lot of ways, choosing to incorporate finger waves, bobbed hair, and fringe dresses in the styling helps set the scene. Now, before anyone gets in my case, I know that fringe was not the most common embellishment of the 1920s. I'm just saying that in the popular consciousness, we associate fringe with the 1920s or vice versa. But the reason why flappers didn't wear a lot of fringe details was because fringe actually weighed down their dresses. Modern fringe is made of lightweight synthetic material. Fringe in the 1920s, on the other hand, was super dense, could weigh up to 25 pounds, and um, got tangled really easily. <laughs> so just not optimal for dancing. The full fringe dresses we do see from the 1920s were not dancing dresses. They were incredibly expensive and intensive to make. I could also argue that the flapper look was Roxy and Velma's purposeful costuming. The point of their act at the end of the movie is that they're young, glamorous, free women. The song nowadays has the lyrics, you can like the life you're living, you can live the life you like, you can even marry Harry or mess around with Ike. The pair is celebrating modern womanhood and freedom in both the personal and systemic sense. And what better way to represent that than bodying the look of the flapper, the 1920s caricature for the modern, independent, rebellious woman. So there you go. Let me know in the comments what you think of Chicago or what you think about theater costumes in general. And I'll see you all next time. Bye.